Greetings and welcome to Productive Discourse. Productive Discourse is a conversation where we talk about the positive activities that take place within our communities. In other words, we're constantly searching for that shiny needle of common ground in that haystack of fear. Today, we're continuing our series about the athletic legends that got their starts in the baseball diamonds, the football fields, and the basketball courts of the city of Oakland. We're talking about people that brought what I call the three E's, energy, enthusiasm, and excellence into their profession where they, many of them won championships, got elected to their sports hall of fame, and came back and served the community. Today's episode is the second part of our interview with Richard Griffin Jr. Griff got to start playing baseball in the Diamonds of Oakland, and he had the opportunity to play and compete with some of the greatest athletes. Many of them became famous from the 1970s. Griff's going to talk about his experiences, and he's also going to talk about what led him to umpiring, where he traveled far and wide to serve the game of baseball and serve as a mentor to a lot of younger people. So please take a listen and enjoy the episode with Griff. You know, do you remember the Bergevich teams out here? They had some great baseball teams. Uh, yeah, I remember Berkovich. I remember A. Bros. Yeah, A. Bros. They got the team I probably got played in. Yeah, right, right. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, those were the two biggest names, weren't they? Yeah, there you go, A. Rosley. Yeah. Sam Scott can tell you all about that. Sam Scott was an excellent pitcher. You know, it was a guy, big, scraggly guy, threw balls from down south, down, you know, three quarters low. Right. You know, brush you off that plate. They threw strikes, go nine innings every week. You yeah. know, and he ended up signing with the A's. He played with Ricky Henderson in Modesto. Okay. You know, and he's a great guy, man. You know, uh, Shooty Babbitt, you know, we saw these guys, they all played. They, everybody had a piece of the Abros League, you know what I mean? Claudio Washington, he, he rest in peace, Claudio. You know, Claudio would call me occasionally before he passed. You know, we would still talk, you know. All these guys played in the Abros League, man. And, uh, yeah, man, some greatest memories in the world, Steve. Yeah. I remember when Claudio went to the A's when he was 18 years old. You remember that? He graduated from high school and Charlie Finley signed him. That's right. And he was in he was in the playoffs. Yeah, hitting against Gaylord Perry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, what was it, 74, and they won the World Series. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's, That's cool. right, Steve. Great memory on that one. But yeah. going to City College was, you know, that was that, that was amazing, man. I mean, the City College experience. I have a friend named Carl Aliotto. He was our center fielder mm -hmm. for the San Francisco City College Rams. And uh we became friends, you know, because I didn't know anyone when I went to City College. They didn't know who I was. You know, I didn't really do much in high school. And here is this kid, brash kid, coming in throwing a big curveball and, you know, and didn't know anyone, didn't know the San Francisco guys or anything. But they they, they, they really took they took me in, man. They took me in. And uh, Carl Aliota was one guy. That we're still friends today as we speak, you know. And we still hang out. Once in a while, he'll walk that beach with me as well. And, uh Great memories. He always, he said, he, he played center field behind me. He would always say, man, I never seen a cur curveball like that. You know, and John Coleman, this is a great story. I'm pitching against Contra Costa College over in Contra Costa in Richmond out here. And I'm throwing the ball well. I mean, people are coming from the stands, get behind the plate to see the curveball. You know, they're all standing behind the backstop. And out of nowhere, my second baseman, John Coleman, fine guy. I love John Coleman. We still talk a little bit here and there now, too. And uh, he calls time out and walks out to the mound. And John, he had these glasses on, you know, and he hit his glove like that. He comes out. He said, hey, Ratch, he had tobacco. You know, John chewed that tobacco too them days. He said, Ratch, you know. I said, what's up? What do you mean, man? Where did you learn that curveball? It's a bumping great. He said, yeah, I don't want to cuss. You know, he said, it's a bleeping great. And I was like, man, that's And he just turned right and walked away. That's all he <laughs> He called time out just to say that. <laughs> I mentioned that to him. I said, John, what makes you do something like that, man? You walk out to the mound. I'm in a groove. You're going to call time out just to come out. Just, where did you get that? It's a bleeping great. <laughs> oh, but, but, those, <laughs> but those guys, man, uh, Ron Black was my catcher. And uh, it was a guy named Ron James. He, he, he didn't play with us, but he played for the San Diego Padres. But he came out work out with us before, game, before he went to spring training. You know, Ray Cozy would do that as well. Sometimes you see Mike Norris around. 
And uh, those guys worked up. We had alumni game going. Oh. And all those guys from the alumni came back. Ron James, you know. Remember, I don't know if you've heard of Wad Eichenberger. He used to pitch for the Padres, too. He played in the big leagues for a while. And uh, we play catch all the time. I know him very well. But in that particular day, the alumni didn't have enough pitching. So I pitched for the alumni against my city college teammates, man. Oh, and, oh I had a blast. Cause we had a guy named Kevin Mitchell. Not the Kevin Mitchell from the Giants, but a guy named Kevin Mitchell from Balboa High School. This guy could break. I mean, he could hit, you know. And uh, I never forget facing him. I always wanted to face him. He talked a lot of good stuff. Man. And he could hit. He could back it up. But, oh, man, that's one of my favorite matchups I ever had. Just pitched against Kevin Mitchell in the alumni game. And Ron James catching me. And uh, Ron's my friend on Facebook now. I'm going to make sure you have a chance to see this, too, because he'll remember this moment. And I'm throwing that fastball. Because, you know, Ron, like my other catcher, he would always say, you guys don't realize grip so harder than you guys think. And I know my curveball, but I had a good fastball. I could blaze it up there around 87, you know. And that's good for a little guy. Only 160 pounds at that time. Right. You know. So uh, Kevin gets the fastball from me the first pitch, and he just looks at it and takes the first strike. And then uh, nods at me like, hey, okay, I got you, Griff. I throw him another fastball right down there. Boom. He took a good cut at him. Found him straight back. Oh, wow. I threw him on that one, right? So Ron James put on down number two for me, number two, the deuce. And I snapped a hard one. It's like more of a slider on this. And I wanted to make sure, you know, he couldn't get no slow curve. I on a big break on He missed it by a foot and swung over the top of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remind him of that, of that every time I see him, man. I got you. You know, don't let him you forget know? that. <laughs> oh, don't forget that one, man. I loved it. You know, the best game I had there was against West Valley College. You know, I, I had a game against, I had a dump. Every, aspect of my baseball life playing, I had a dominant performance at every level. And that's what I love about, you know, the game. You know, you I wasn't consistent enough because of all field activities. I would just say that. Mm -hmm. But when I had my mind to it, I always said that anytime I threw the ball well and got on top and followed through and we stayed focused, I don't care who you were. I feel like I can beat you. Wow. And it was like that. Now, and then West Valley had a great hitting team. They had to beat Diablo Valley like 19 to, some, 19 to 7 or something. I went out there, man, and they couldn't touch me, man. I, I had a big curveball going that day. And uh, it was like 93 degrees in San Saratoga. And, I'm, and that was my best game ever pitched. And after that game, those kids followed me to the bus <laughs> and trying to hand me beers from through the window, man. Whoa, <laughs> here's a beer. I said, get one to my catcher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the catcher's the one that did the work, right? Yeah, give one to my catcher. Give one to Ron Black. Yeah, yeah, get that to Ron, man. Take care of Ron for me. Back there with that equipment on. But yeah, man, uh, City College was a great experience for me. You know, I met some great people. Like I said, Ray Cozy, Carl Aliotto, Kenny Block, uh, Kevin Mitchell, Bill Murray, John Coleman, Dave Bowles, you know, uh, Ron James, Juan Eichenberger. I mean, it goes on and on. Just some great people. The late A.D. Hanna. You know, you don't forget these people. And then the coaches, Ernie Dominguez. You know, Ernie Dominguez was good for me, man. He he let me get in. He told me, man, he said he didn't know who I was. He he took a chance with me and gave me a chance to play baseball at the junior college level. And, I, and I'm ever, you know, forever grateful for that, man. He was a good dude. Dan Hayes is assistant coach. He still is assistant coach at City College football games now. And I go to the games sometimes and run into him. And he just hugs the heck out of me, man. Because those guys wish I would have finished up at City College. Because, you know, once I pitched at City, USF was very interested in me. Oh, really? Uh, but then he, he, the coach over there, he had all the pitchers. I pitched against him at US uh, at Golden Gate Park in the, pre, you know, fall league game, preseason game. And he had all his pitchers lined up on one knee and told them to watch me. <laughs> wow. Because I threw strikes, you know? Yeah. And he was, he, was, he was mad at his pitchers for some reason. I guess he was pounding them. He was mad at them. Man, watch me. And I I shut them down. Matter of fact, Steve, I pitched a no-hitter against San Francisco State in the fall league game. That don't count, though, but I pitched a no-hitter as a freshman against San Francisco State. Nice. <laughs> I don't even talk about that because it wasn't a league game. You know what I mean? But it still happened. It happened. <laughs> it happened. It happened. All right. Yes, sir. So, yeah. what, what led you to become an umpire? Oh, Steve, this is a great story, man. Uh, I never wanted to be an umpire, man. Who would who want to be behind that plate, that ball bouncing off of you like that? I never dreamed of being an umpire. Nothing in my life told me I would umpire a baseball game. But I was at 
Greenman Field, I think I was, and at a baseball game, just sitting around in the stands. It was that was 78, 78, you know, seven, maybe a 78. And Bill Green, he's he, rest in peace, Bill. He was the guy who assigned the high school umpires and Beirut umpires and all that stuff back in those days. Well, at this particular time, I'm just sitting out there, but the umpires didn't show up. And somebody saw me sitting out there, that's Rich Griffin up there, man. He played, he might can call it. I said, oh, no. <laughs> you know, I'm not doing that. But then they just they persisted, persisted. So I stood behind the mound. I was doing a JV game for Skyline against Fremont. Behind the mound. Mm -hmm. You know, not behind the plate. So I called it from out there. So after the game, the coaches said, geez, that was the best game we ever had from an umpire, you know? <laughs> what? And then Bill Green came to me after the game and said, we're going to pay you for this. I said, you get paid for this? That was the beginning. 1978. And my first varsity game, that's how I started, right there. And I didn't have any gear. I, had a, I got a windbreaker and a little hat. And, you know, I didn't have any equipment yet. And I went over to Alameda, a cruisy park, and – uh over on Bay Farm Island, I forgot the name of that park over there. I did a game over there. Lightbacker. Late, yeah. yeah. Then I did another game. My first varsity game was Lincoln Park in Alameda on the base. I finally got some gray pants, the blue shirt, you know, and looked like an umpire. And I was doing Alameda High. That's when Kenny Arnold seen mm -hmm. and shortstop. He was playing shortstop for the Alameda Hornets at that time. What a great – I was so impressed with him back in those days. You know, and uh, that's my first game, man. Lincoln Park, a big crowd out there, you know, on the first baseline, you know, the, the stands at Lincoln. And I'd always watch, see my pro games there and I pitched there many times, but here I was on part of the varsity game. And I, I grew I grew into it. I grew into it, Steve. And I, then eventually I got my equipment. The first time I did behind the plate with some equipment on was at Bushrod Park for a Bay Ruth game. And Steve, I was so scared. You know, I wanted to use the big balloon, you know. <laughs> but the inside equipment, my arms, I, I was like, so I'm running and ducking. And one guy uh, swung and missing. I called him the ball. And the guy said, he swung. I mean, they were cussing me out, calling me all kinds of names. And I was scared. And they fell the ball and I ducked. And I was, it was horrible. So finally, I said to myself, and I said, man, you get beat up back there from running from the ball. You're getting beat up. I'm about sitting back and just relaxing. And seeing what happens because you're running into it anyhow. So the next time I got out there, man, I sat out, got behind that plate. It was like watching the game on TV. And I fell in love with being behind the plate. The ball whizzed by me. I don't have to worry about nothing. The catchers were protecting me because I wasn't running around. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with the game. But I still had that big balloon that Eddie Jewell gave me. Right. <laughs> And I would use it. I used it at Washington Park for a St. Joe's game. They had me in the newspaper running around that. Big, I still have that picture with that big balloon in my head <laughs> running oh, around. That big balloon chest protector. Yes, yes. I love that. It protected you well, you know. But, you know, I didn't know umpiring would get that serious for me. I was umpiring a, a district all-star game in 83 at the San Leandro Ballpark. And this man comes down to the dressing course where we dressed that name, Ron Shy. Rest in peace, Ron. He was the Pacific Southwest Commissioner for Beirut Baseball. And he looked at me. He said, I really like the way you handle yourself on that ball field, you know. I love the game. The thing, if you love the game, you are gonna you, you want it to be right. You want it to be right for the kids. So, I, you know, I did my best to make sure the calls were made honestly, you know, made the calls honestly. And he saw that in me, and he saw how I controlled the game. He knew I was a pitcher, so I know how to wait for the curveball to come down, you know. I love killing pitchers to corners. You know, I love that. Ask your son, Phil. He don't know about the corners. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he came into the locker room, and he says, uh, I want you to become a, a regional umpire for me. I want you to, you know, travel and, and do Southwest regional tournaments for me. I said, oh, no, I don't want to go anywhere. I'll just do it around here. So I think he would like it. So they assigned me to a state tournament first. Then that next year, man, I think it was 1985, I went to Lodi and I'm part of the Pacific Southwest Regional Tournament. And Alameda was there. Mm -hmm. That's when they had JR. That's the year they won the World Championship. That JR Ryder and Ted oh, uh, Lingowski. 85 or something? 80, like 85, yeah. yeah. And they were there, you know. And I and it was and the guy, uh, Jeff Sorello played. Mm -hmm. He played for Milwaukee Brewers later. He was playing for Southern Cal. I mean, there's a lot of great talent out there, man. A tremendous job. It was 98, 95 degrees every day, you know. 
And uh, I, I did the uh, Lengowski's gym when he had, a, I think he pitched my pitch to no hitter out there. But I had a shutout. I know it was a shutout at least. And I had him behind the plate. And it was one of the best experiences I ever had in my life, man. You know, and he told me, look at here, Griff, man. You know, you did a great job out here. You know, you can travel from here to Guamania. We're going to see you somewhere every year. And that's what happened. So after that, I just fell in love, man. I thought that Bishop O'Dowd, what's the great school in uh, Concord that had the winning streak in football? Uh, Dallas Allen. Yeah. yeah. The greatest high school game I had was Dallas Allen against Bishop O'Dowd for the uh, the, for the championship. Mm-hmm. You know, for North Coast Section Championship over at, at, at Dallas South. I remember people sitting on roofs. I mean, they all around at the plate for that game, you know. So it, it became big for me. And I did junior college ball. I am part of my old city college, I'm part of Laney College for Tom First and J.B. Jackson and their, uh, I think Damian Jackson that played, that played for the Padres for a while. Uh, Reggie Attaway. The Attaways were great. Eric Attaway was my teammate in high school. And they played in the Alameda Park Leagues too, even though they lived in Oakland. You know, the Attaways. I think Greg probably still probably holds the scoring record over there for hooping. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah, the guy was, yeah, he was something else. He ended up playing for Portland, I believe. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Attaways, man. We It was it was a great, 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 great times, man. So, yeah, man, it, it, it's very interesting, man. So you also had some experience with Randy Johnson, didn't you? Absolutely. You know, uh <laughs> It's like almost like a horror film, you know. I didn't know who this kid was. Big, tall, gangly guy out in Livermore pitching Legion ball. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm behind the plate in this 98-degree heat, man. And uh, I, I wasn't very experienced. I'm still a very young umpire. I might be my first or second year umpiring, you know. And they, they, in those days, there were not a lot of associations. People just needed umpires, and they'd call somebody, and they'd come get you, and, oh, and you're out there. And, and here it was, you know. And. I didn't know who this kid was, but I know one thing. He didn't have that control that he had as a professional, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he was just a kid throwing hard. And I took a beating back there. I never believed. I almost quit umpiring. And the guy was saying, well, I said, I, I said hey, who is this guy pitching? They said, well, that's Randy Johnson. That's where I'm from. I said, I don't care who it is. He can't throw. <laughs> you know, he can't pitch. You know, you, know, you never know. You talk about a Hall of Famer, but you, I didn't care at that time. I was just mad. And I was young umpiring. Uh, I didn't really know much about this kid. All I know was I was taking a beating, you know. <laughs> and sometimes these catchers, these catchers can't handle these hard throwing pitchers like right. that. <laughs> you know, you had another guy that pitched for the uh, A's. What's his name? He wasn't a pitcher, I think. Well, what's this big kid name? He played for the Giants too. Uh, Dave Haverlow. No, it was a right hand. He went to Skyline High. This kid threw Blazers, man, and he ended up. He's, What's this kid name? I can't think of his name, so let's forget about it. Okay. That, that, there's a memory left. But he threw so hard, he hit me right in the face mask one day at Skyline High. Hmm. But the catcher couldn't catch up with it. He was throwing 97, you know, 97 oh. miles per hour. And he, yeah. the ball didn't touch him. It just hit me in my mask. He knocked my mask to the side. And I was like, days. I had to go to work at Treasure Island later on that day. I was doing a morning game where I had to work at 3 o'clock at the Treasure Island. And I went to work. They say, what's wrong with you? I said, I think I'm still in a daze. Yeah. <laughs> it just hit me in the face, man, with a 90-mile-per-hour fastball. But, you know, Ryan Drees, you don't know if you remember Ryan Drees, he ended up pitching for the Rangers later on, and he played Major League Baseball out of Bishop O'Dowd. And I did one of his games. He was throwing 93, 94 in high school, you know. But he had control. And, I, and you know, at that time, I became a veteran umpire. And I, and I settled down. I loved it. I love fireballers. I had some fireballers in Arizona, Yuma, Arizona. We left in a guy throwing 97 miles per hour. He ended up pitching for the Colorado Rockies, but his name slips my mind as well. But every time I would see him on TV, I said, I know that face. It was this kid. He was in Arizona. He was throwing darts, but he was on the corners. And it was just a beautiful thing to do, man. I mean, you know, umpiring is wonderful back there when the game is being played right. Right. And that, and, and that, that that's what I love. You know, at Incident High with Dontrell Willis, you know, Don Trail, I knew Don Trail as a kid. You know, for a little while, I did some work at the uh, BV's Recreation Department over in Alameda. Mm-hmm. So I got to know Don Trail and, and Corey Dunlop very well. I took him guys over and soft talks to him. Got Tory how to, got to, uh, taught Corey how to get on top of that ball instead of swinging under it. He became a great hitter, and he'll give me credit today for that. You know, he was a third-round pick for the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. But Don Trail, Don Trail, I umpired Don Trail first game in the All-Stars, and he was 13 years old. At College of Alameda, the first time they ever had a game at the College of Alameda. And I did the first game ever played there. 
And Don Trey was on the mound as a 13 year old kid, and he curled a shutout. I mean, he was great. You know, that kid had the leg kick, he was the ball, low strikes, good low strikes as a 13 year old. You need to get the lower strike than your 13 year old. Mm -hmm. But I had him later on in high school at Encinal. This is a good story. You like this. And he's pitching because we always talk all the time. Him and Corey come up and meet me in the parking lot, and we talk, and I tell him about things. But this particular game, he was pitching. And I'm behind the plate at Encinal. He's throwing nice. He's throwing a good job. But he's throwing low strikes, and they wasn't, they're wasn't too low. And I was saying, I'm not giving the ball. Ball. He pops a little bit. So I call a timeout. And I walk out to the mound of Don Trail. I said, listen here, Don Trail. Turn your hat around. Tuck your shirt in. And I understand you're not getting those strikes you got when you're 13 years old. Come on, man. I got you. And he looked at me all serious. Oh, good grip. <laughs> he became that little kid again. I had to get on pretty sturdy. Nobody's showing me up. Man, you're not getting that anymore. You know. So later on, we had to talk. We got to talk about it in the parking lot of the college of Alameda. Him, Corey, Dunlop, and I stay around talking. I say, Don Trail, the reason I had to say that to you was, you know, you're getting ready for the next level now. You're not going to get those pitches anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to give them to you now. You got to get ready, son. And that's all that was. It wasn't personal. And he, so he took it good there. But on that mound, I had to go out there and sternly talk to him. Talk to you, Shorty. Turn that cap around. Turn that cap around. <laughs> yeah, get right. Yeah, but it, that was a great experience for him, man. And something we always laugh about, you know. But Don Trell was outstanding. And Corey Dunlop was one of the best. He hit a home run. I was behind the plate. We'll talk about this all, all the time. Corey Dunlop was one of my favorite players. I love that kid. And uh, I'm umpiring. It was a summer league game. We're at the College of Alameda, and they had the bases loaded, and I'm behind the plate, and Corey's up. And the guy throws the ball to Corey almost, almost, almost high level. And he tomahawks it just like I told him that, that hey, he got that top hit on, hit a line drive that was no higher than that, and it hit the center field fence and just skipped over it straight away center for a grand slam. I never forget that. Yeah, man. Hit a line drive straight over the center field fence. And it skipped off the top and went straight over the center field wall. And he crossed it. When he came across that plate, I just looked at him and winked at him. You know, that, that boy, that's one of the most impressive home runs I've ever seen. And it was eye level. Eye level. I mean, he hammered it out. Yeah. How you get on top of that ball, son? He said, that's what you taught me, Rich. <laughs> get that top hand on top of it. There's yeah. another guy that played at Laney College that signed with the Angels, ended up playing with the A's, I believe. James Jackson, JB, they called him. He had one of the longest home runs I've ever seen at the San Andrew Ballpark and at Laney College in the streaks out there. He had tremendous power, you know. But I want to mention a few names to you, too. A uh, guy like uh, Ernie Applewhite, Mobile Cox, you know. These guys were, I mean, come on. I mean, you wouldn't believe the things these guys did as kids. You know, not Applewhite, but Mobile Cox, you know. Mobile Cox was one of my favorite players. He played with Ricky Henderson at Tech. What about Smitty, the little right-hander? Gerald Smith, outstanding, outstanding. You know, he threw hard. He was like, he's small like me. So he was my role model. When I got to see him pitch, when I was, before I even went to Freeman, I would go to games at Greenman Field because my team would practice after they play. So I would already be at the field. I got to see these guys play, man. I couldn't wait to get to the oil to play with them, you know. But he was, these guys were just, hey, man, some amazing talent comes out of Oakland, California. And umpiring gave me a chance to see even more. If you played baseball in Oakland from 1978 to 2010, anywhere in the Bay Area, throughout Northern California, I, pro I, I probably umpired your ball game. You know? wow. Yeah, everyone. I mean, Jimmy Rollins, you know, we go up to the BVs and Jimmy Rollins would be in that batting cage over at Ensnell, man, working from his left side. I said, how are you switching it, huh? And he's working on it late evening. He's out there working on his game. The thing I remember most about the guys that really made it real big, they really worked at their craft. Mm -hmm. Ricky Henderson was the same way. Have you out there all day? You want to do something? You guys want to work? I said, man, he, he, and we didn't argue Utah. He wouldn't even hang out. You know, he's sleeping baseball, sleeping baseball. You got to understand why he made it to the major leagues like he did, man. He, he really dedicated his life to that craft. You know, and that's what that's he, the he separates. That's, that's the difference. That's I'm in terms of the difference between him and I, because I didn't, you know. <laughs> I didn't have, but I needed that type of mentor. I didn't really have that mentor in baseball once DeWitt left me and went, uh, moved on away. And I didn't get to play Beirut ball. And I started working and stuff. But baseball, umpire, and Steve is the best thing that ever happened to me. And that's how I became a scout through baseball umpire. Yeah. So how do, uh, how do you like retirement now? Hey, man, you know, 
I dreamed of this, you know. And I knew two years before I was going to retire, you know, in 19, I told the people at work, you know, I'm going to be leaving. You know, I want to spend more time with the wife because my hours were always working that job. I worked as twin, twin shift from three to midnight. So, you know, I missed dinners every night with the family, the wife, you know, that's a lot of years of that, you know. So I could, I look forward to being 62 and retiring and just coming out and uh, giving more time to the family and myself. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me, man. Uh, I'm taking care of myself better. You know, due, due to retirement, you know, just uh, the exercise. I stopped umpiring in 2010, but I came back after I retired mm -hmm. in 19. That's why I started umpiring that season in 20, but they called it short because of the pandemic. And I'm debating if I want to come back next year. But I did do some games this summer for Kenny Arnrich, you know, the young Kenny, over at uh, the little park in uh, Bay Farm Island for the little rascals team he has. Yeah. And yeah, and I umpired like eight, nine games for him just to get, get some man, get some work in and have some fun. And I think that that's going to be uh, during retirement, I'll be just a independent contractor, maybe just do some games if I need me to come out, work some games. I'll come out and do a few here and there. Right. But do retirement, go ahead. Do it on your terms. Yes, absolutely. But retirement, you have, it, it, it's ideal. I haven't really gotten to it like I really want to yet because of the pandemic, you know, because I have some things I want to do. But, uh, oh, Steve, this is, this is wonderful. I mean, every day is Friday, you yeah. know, and uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mondays are not grueling anymore, you know. I don't drive as much anymore, you know. I don't, I don't drive too much, you know, unless I need to really go somewhere, you know. Uh, being around the house, doing more things around my home, you know, with the wife. You know, I have a wonderful wife, Harriet, man. She's wonderful. She stuck through everything with me. All those days of umpiring, traveling, you know, coaching. Because I coached at Patton College, too. I didn't mention that to you. For two years, I was the pitching coach there in the NAIA division, you know. So I was gone a lot. I've been gone a lot. You know, I've spent a lot of time with my wife. But she's always there working at midnight, but still doing umpiring on weekends. And then going out of town for tournaments and woo woo. She even came to Lodi to watch me on fire in 89 when I went back out there. She came out there with me and spent some time with me. And we was just, just half some time together. But, you know, uh, geez, man, you know, this is the best thing that ever happened to me to have this time, you know, to be sitting here talking with you. And, you know, uh, it's the best thing in the world. I love retirement, man. And just finally have that peace of mind where I can have dinner at home with my wife. <laughs> it's the little things you, you, that you appreciate more. It's the little things, not really the big things. Everybody, oh, I want to do that. With. No, it's just it's the little things I appreciate so much. Morning and evening prayer, you know, that I wasn't able to do all the time because I'm always on the run, you know. So uh, I'm loving this peace of mind and looking at baseball cards I had here for years. I didn't even look at them. They've been in plastics. These things probably they haven't been graded, but I'm sure they're PSA 10. They're in excellent condition. And a lot of boxes, <laughs> a lot of boxes have not even been opened, but, uh, Looking at baseball cards and enjoying some of the things I've done over the years. I'm looking back on what I've done. You know, it, it's amazing, man. I, I didn't. I, when you're doing things, Steve, you don't realize how much you're doing. Right. You know, I, 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 yeah. Because I ran a basketball league at the East Lake YMCA too. When I did baseball, I always had basketball leagues and flag football leagues. I had adult leagues where, you know, I had Marlon Redman and John Lambert. I mean, NBA guys come play in my leagues. You know, and. Uh, Gene Ransom, I mean, some of the great players, Keith McDonald, you know, Willard White, all these guys played my adult leagues, you know, so far and away, man, it's retirement has you, gives you an opportunity to reflect on all these things. And when you're doing, you don't realize it, man. And like all the guys that worked at the Y and when I back in the day, we all met our wives at the Y. And they was like, how did that happen? Well, you weren't doing anything else, you know, you... <laughs> My life was dedicated right here. My Friday nights were here. My Saturdays were there. I gave overnight camps for the kids. I took them camping. I did everything at the Y. So them, year, them days in your 20s, and then the other time, I had a little time I hang out with Harry them, you know? <laughs> but uh, it was it was the kids, man. It was the kids, you know? So we didn't really know what time for nothing else but just dedicating your life to baseball and kids, you know? And, and what a wonderful thing to look back on. No, what a wonderful thing to look back on, man. Yeah. You know? Great. So we're getting through the pandemic. Hopefully there's light at the end of the, the tunnel. What's on your bucket list? Uh, what do you want to do next? Uh, I want to go out to spring training, you know. And That's a good time. At the, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to go out to spring training and hang out in Arizona, spend some time out there. And then just 
you know, got grandkids in Georgia, in Augusta, Georgia, out there. And I'm gonna spend some time out there with the kids and hang out and just. Um, I drove. The, I, you know, I flew out there a couple of times. You know, I haven't never took the train. So my one thing I want to do, I want to get a sleep car and, and take me a, a train ride across the country, man. That would be fun. Yeah. Yes, I'm, that's something I'm going to do, and so I look forward to doing that. But I'm also going to do another drive across the country again too, and without worrying about work. You know, I can stop more places, spend more time in other places, and, and see more ballparks. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to go to those, a couple of ballparks on my bucket list that I have to see. You know, I got to see Yankee Stadium. You know, you know, and I and I and I really want to see Fenway Park and Wrigley Field, the old antique ballparks. Mm-hmm. So those are a couple of things I want to do. So the bucket list and just spend time with the wife, you know, just actually have this time with the wife. Finally, we're having this time together, you know, where, you know, it's been wonderful. You know, I even got her out to, to the beach the other day to walk with me, Good. you know, so, yeah, it's basically just uh, travel, continue to eat right, you know, and enjoy baseball, the game I love. Yeah. Enjoy baseball, Steve. All right. Well, I really appreciate you being on here today. This has been a great conversation. You're you're an unbelievable storyteller. Oh man, I got some great. Oh, I want to say one more one more shout out for the group. Okay. Uh, for, Steve, I'm a I'm a I'm a practicing Buddhist. Mm-hmm. You know, so I just want to give credit and, and a shout out to the SGI, the Soka Gakkai International Group that I chant with. You know, without the Buddhist practice and the focus that it's given me, giving me, to become a better person, I wouldn't be here today. Right. So I just want to give a credit out to the SGI. And been a practicing Buddhist since 1989. It's really got my life together. I mean, I'm, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I'm clean. I mean, I just love it. Yeah, I love the life I live right now. And I give all the credit to the Buddhist practice that I am active pr- practitioner in right now today. So, yeah. Excellent. I always like to yeah. give, give the shout outs and I always like the people that are on the show to talk about what they're working on. So that, that's great. Yes, so, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, anyway, I appreciate you being on here and we're going to do this over several weeks. Uh, I'm going to have a different guest every week because there's just so many stories out of Oakland. And I may be calling you, Griff, and uh, having you suggest some names I should talk to because you dropped a lot of names and I bet yeah. a lot of these guys are still around. Absolutely. I'm in, I'm in touch with a lot of them, you know, through Facebook and everything. And uh, So we're going to share this with them and we're going to try to get them involved with you as well to share some even more fascinating stories. All right. Well, that sounds good. So this is... Episode one, we will be back next week for episode two. If you'd like to know more about what we do at Productive Discourse, just go to productivediscourse.home.blog. That website talks about all our activities, and it also shows you how you can talk to, contact me if you'd like me to speak at your church, your community organization, your service club, or your Toastmasters club. So we'll be back next week. But in the meantime, please like, share, comment, subscribe so this message will go far and wide. And we'll find that shiny needle of common ground in that haystack of fear.